welcome back to the afternoon session. It is my pleasure to introduce Chris, who works for a company who's based in Singapore, but he's not from Singapore himself. But, but I thought he was. So today's trivia question for the bar of chocolate is that Singapore has a nickname named after an animal. Did anybody know the name of the animal that Singapore is named after? Lion, there we go. Chris? Uh, all right. Hi, everybody. Can, can everyone hear me OK? I guess you're all on translation. So as long as the translation person can hear me, OK. So my name is Chris Natsume. Uh, the talk today was supposed to be given by my business partner, Alan Siemenson. And four days ago, he got put in a hospital, and they removed one of his organs. So that's probably the best excuse I've ever heard for not giving a lecture. Um, the studio was started by Alan and myself. Alan is the technical director of the studio, and I'm the creative director of the studio. And he wanted to give a speech today called The Designer is the Enemy, about how terrible it is to work with creatives such as myself. And I find it extremely ironic that here I am giving that speech for him. So we're going to talk about the designer being the enemy, and the enemy stands before you. I am the designer. So to get started. Um, there's Alan and myself. Uh, he wanted to say that he does not hate all designers, just most of them. I'm going to assume that he meant I was in the group that he does not hate, or we should hope. So why does Alan hate designers, or many of them? And his answer is, most designers are pretty much useless, because what they do is they produce documentation. And the honest answer is, nobody reads documentation. Having people sitting around the studio whose job it is to produce ideas that other people will implement is a crazy notion and one that we don't support. And to give an example of that, I've, I've been working in the game industry since 1992, 93, something like that. And in that time, I've written hundreds of design documents. And at some point, I got very frustrated, and I started putting a line in every document that I wrote that was longer than 25 pages that said, if you read this line, I will pay you $5. Please come to my desk, and I will give it to you. And in over 10 years of game development, nobody ever collected the $5. So that gives you an idea of the value of your big, long game design documents. So in our studio, we wanted to create a way where we could have designers, but have those designers be meaningful parts of the game development process where they weren't just people having ideas, but people who could meaningfully get their hands into the game and implement their ideas. And more importantly, to do that in a way where we could remove the programmer from that process, because in many ways we see that programmer as a bottleneck to the process, as opposed to somebody who is a necessary impl implementation step. So we'll talk a bit more about that as we go forward. So, I have to do two computers at once. It's very confusing for me. Uh, I, I don't read Russian. Um, so fight smart, not hard. And those of you who saw this movie, this is the classic scene from Indiana Jones where the guy comes out and swings a sword around. And Indiana Jones sighs and says, bah, and shoots him instead of having the big sword fight. Um, a bit of trivia, that actually happened because Harrison Ford had a terrible case of explosive diarrhea that day, and he could not be bothered to do the fight scene. That's a true story. And so he just pulled the gun out and shot it as a joke, and it was so cool that they kept it. So there's a little bit of trivia for you. But the argument Alan is making here with Harrison Ford and his diarrhea is that fixing bugs is hard. And when you think about the time invested in finding a bug, tracking a bug, assigning a bug, reproducing the bug, fixing the bug, trying to reproduce it again to make sure if it got fixed. That's stupid. Just don't have bugs. And so the most important thing that you can think about is not how do we find these bugs, et cetera, but how do you create a process that eliminates bugs from the beginning? Of course, you can't eliminate all bugs, but a process that allows you to eliminate a great many of the bugs, thus making your QA process in the end much smaller. And the the thing that we have to look at is what we call monkey steps. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about monkey steps. But monkey steps are places in the product when you're developing that a, a primate, such as myself, 
will take his little fingers and stick them into your product and mess around with it. And every time somebody does that, that's another chance for them to introduce bugs and break things. And so as much as possible, we want to take those little monkey fingers and take them out of the game and replace them with automated processes. And we'll talk a lot about that here in just a little bit. Next slide. So the universe is a, a constant struggle between engineers making things that are more idiot proof and God making better idiots. And so far, God is winning. That's a quote from somebody, I'm not sure who, and Alan has not attributed that quote to anybody in his notes, so whoever it is I'm ripping off, I apologize. He did add another quote, which is, the simplest bug to fix is the one that they couldn't make. And that comes from John Carmack, so that, that's a guy who knows what he's talking about. Um, what we do in removing those monkey steps from the process is to make modules that self-audit their data. Um, to one of the rules in our studio is data shall not break the code, right? Now you can put data into the game and that data can do some weird stuff and produce some weird results and that's okay because it's data. The program or the designers need the ability to put things in that will change things. But it should never break the game. The, the game should never stop or crash because of something that a designer does. And we have to create code that produces a valid scripting ability for the designer that does not produce, that does not allow the ability for them to actually crash the game, only to produce odd results. Um, every programmer in the company gets a crash dump email if any of our games ever crashes in development, right? And th this is very critical. And this is a, a moment of shame, right? Because we can't go to that designer and say to the designer, you broke my game, designer. No, 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 no. You, programmer, gave that monkey a way to break the game. And because that monkey will break the game, he put his finger in there and he broke the game. And so the question when we solve it is not how do we fix this bug? The question is, obviously, we've let this monkey into our code. How do we monkey proof this step so that he cannot break our game again? And it's a, it's a critically different way of thinking and it's critical to our success as a company. Um, Reduce, reuse, recycle. Don't reinvent the wheel, especially if you're the one that invented the wheel. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at the code that we've done in the past, and instead of saying, ah, oh, well, this code was broken, or this code didn't do what we wanted to do, making small adjustments to the code to reuse it and customize it. Um, we design our code to be controlled in data by designers and as well as overloaded by programmers. And, and I don't know if that makes sense. Um, old code rots. As you move on, if you, have, if you have the same code base and you start project A with this code base and you say now we're going to do project B which looks much like that and project C which looks much like that, right? If you're carrying that code from project to project, it's going to constantly be updated with little changes Oh, there's a new version of Windows that came out. Oh, there's a new API that your publisher wants you to use. Oh, this is a problem that we found with screen res. There's a million little tiny things that you're going to update that code for. And the minute you stop and say, I'm going to go write some better code, you have taken that institutional memory of all of those tiny little fixes that you made and thrown that away and said, now we're going to start from scratch and we're going to have to go rediscover every one of those stupid little things again. And now you've got a bug list that's this long. And so we don't do that. We started with a base of code in our studio in 2005 when we started. I think we started in 2005. And so what is that, seven years now, we're still using the same core code base. Now obviously over seven years, new modules have been added, things have been changed, things have been refactored. But at no point in that process did we ever say, Let's throw all this away and start over again. There's still code today in our games that we wrote back in 2005, and we're really proud of it. Um, I don't know if you guys know anything about our studio. Uh, I don't think I even mentioned the name. The studio is BoomZap. I think it was on a slide earlier. We make predominantly hidden object adventure puzzle games for big fish games. So if you ever played Awakening, that was one of ours. Uh, Dana Nightstone, we just released a new game called Botanica. 
uh, I forget what else we've done. Antique road trip, I think Paul Thalen mentioned that in his uh, talk this morning. Um, and all of these games are relatively similar. They have a, a, a sort of similar framework. And so for us, it's been very easy to move from project to project, tweaking and changing that code a little bit. Um, and I think that's been one of the real strengths of our studio. I think for other studios that are doing radically different projects, it may be more challenging, but I would say the basic idea that most of what you're doing in code is probably related to what you're doing on your next project and you probably should keep it around. Um, nobody actually translated this comic, so I, I will read the comic out to you, I'm sorry. Uh, in, in the first slide, um, they're, they're playing chess, and somebody says, well, why did you move your knight away? Just think logically. The goal is checkmate, so you should always move pieces toward the other player's king. I guess occasionally you need to move backward, but it would be trivial to figure out a list of all the circumstances, and, and the guy interrupts and says, have you ever played chess? Well, no, not much, but do you want to play chess? Well, okay. And they play, and the guy beats him. And the response from the, uh, the guy who doesn't play chess is, this game isn't very well designed. For starters, the knights are too weak. Um, I, I don't know if that's funny in translation, but it's very funny in English, I promise. And the argument is, programmers tend to make very good system designers. They think about systems. And, and often they're, they're good gameplay designers, um, but they're usually really bad data designers. Programmers don't tend to think that way. Programmers tend to think of, I want to build a skeleton or a framework that we can hook a number of different things into. When you get to the point of putting all of those things into those hooks, programmers get bored. They've done the fun part of the work, the interesting part of the work. This is what we have designers for. And designers love and joy is to make lists and to make variables and to put things onto all of those hooks. And so in the way that we build, we, we think about the programmers not as somebody who builds a game, but for, as somebody who builds a framework that a designer can come and build a game upon. And the designer's not going to tell the programmer what game he's going to, the, the programmer is going to go make. That's not the programmer's job. The programmer's job is to provide the designer with the tools that he needs to make the game that he wants to make. In this relationship, it is very important for the programmer to listen to what the designer is trying to accomplish and not the feature that he says that he wants. Right? Because in the same way that programmers are very good at making a structure, designers are really bad at making that structure. They're really good at the data. But if you say, well, what exactly game do you want? And tell me the data that you, the designer doesn't know. He doesn't understand the way to craft that structure properly. Um, and so it's very important to listen to what the designer's final goal is, and then to step back and say, well, how can I make a framework that he could build that upon? Or if he were to pull all of that data off again, how could he build something different with that framework so that I don't have to make him a new framework every time we build a new game? Um, and this has been part of the story of the success of our studio, is building that framework and then giving those tools to the designer. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. So a little bit about us. Uh, I haven't talked about us. Uh, we're a totally virtual studio. There's 65 people in BoomZap today. Uh, we're in eight different countries, including Ukraine, Russia, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, Georgia. I always forget Georgia. Hello. Um, each developer needs to be able, so all of these people are working at home. There's no office. There's no coming up behind somebody's shoulder and tap, 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 I need you to fix my game. That thing is impossible in our office. Everybody is sitting at home alone with a computer and an MSN chat where they can bitch when they are angry. And so in this situation, everybody needs to have a lot of individual freedom in the way that they build. Um, especially because uh, our, our internet speeds are really terrible. You, you heard the countries that we work in, Indonesia, Philippines. These are not countries known for their great internets. And so we need to give people a lot of power to work independently on their own machines to get things into the build without involving somebody else and uploading data and downloading data again, testing it, making sure everything works, and then taking that final product and adding it to the, the full product that we need to build. 
this is a critical way that we started. Um, I'm going to skip that slide because we're running low on time. So back to my monkey. Um, any manual step in the process is called a monkey touch. And your grain will break if you have too many monkeys touching it. As the touches add up, the probability of data errors becomes a certainty. And so what we try to do is look at each process in our development and create one touch processes. So for instance, our build process. We have a single build generating tool that has a number of functions that we can set for which publisher are we building this for, which distributor are we building this for, is it for iOS, is it for PC, is it for Mac, what language is it in. Set all those options, push the button, and all of the things that create those things are all automated. We can't break that. It's impossible for, for that to be broken. Computers don't mess that kind of thing up. And so this allows us to get rid of a, a bunch of useless work that we do in the studio. That's one example. We, we have many other examples uh, in the way that we build our UI uh, and other things like that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some examples to get closer to it. So the first game we did was a game called Jules of Cleopatra. Um, and it was actually a match three game. And it was a good game. Um, so in this version, uh, um, designers aren't coders. They're going to take one look at complex scripting engines, and they're just going to say, no, that, I don't, I'm a designer. I don't code. right?" And in that situation, when the designer and the programmers are in that relationship, the programmer now has to write a bunch of scripts. And once you're in the world of scripts, you're not writing code anymore. You're writing scripts. You don't have a debugger anymore. And so now when things break, it's a terrible situation. It's not what coders are happy with. Coders don't want to work in scripts. Coders want to work in code. And so it, it, it's kind of a, a bad place to be. And what we did is the, the first iteration of our, our tools for doing this was we used Excel. And we still do today, um, partially because I have an MBA and I just love Excel. It's God's program. And I was the designer when we started, so that's what we used. And it was actually a very good choice for us because Excel is an extremely robust data munging tool. We can do many things with data in Excel, and I don't have to get a coder to make all that functionality. It's all there. Excel is an extraordinarily powerful tool. So what we do is we put all of the variables, all the things that all the all the hooks that we want to put on the tree, and we said, let's put all that in Lua, all the all the little variable bits. And then we'll have Lua spit out, or, I'm sorry, not Lua, in, in Excel. Then we'll have Excel use Visual Basic to spit out a Lua file. Now the Lua file can't be broken. It wasn't made by humans. No monkey fingers were in that. It's all little digital fingers, and digital fingers work well. And so if something was broken, we knew that the thing that was broken was in the data itself, not in the formatting of the data. And this is actually a more important thing than you might imagine. I can get into more details if anyone has questions later, but I want to move on. Second game we did, Awakening the Dreamless Castle. This was the first of the Awakening series. Um, and it was a very, very good project, but we actually kind of messed up in our way of thinking a little bit because we said, let's give the designers a lot more power. And basically, we changed our Excel engine to allowing them to more or less write Lua functions in Excel. And then it will create the formatting for you. And we thought this was great, because now the designer will have all the power. The, think of the tools he has. And what it ended up being was, think of the bugs he can create. Um, with, with great power came uh, the, the power to break things. And so this ended up being a quite difficult game for us to complete because of all the bugs and the process that the, and all the corner cases and things that we ended up dealing with. And so we were a, a little bit, eh, a little bit unhappy with that. We gave too much fine control to the designers. And, and there were a lot of sort of, the, the beta to gold process took a long time. And the realization was, the core takeaway was, designers don't think defensively. Designers live in a happy place where things go well. And they assume that if they're close, things are going to work out. Programmers are the most negative people you will ever meet. And it's good in their position, because they're always thinking about, how can this thing be broken? And when we gave all of this power to the designers, they didn't think defensively enough. And they introduced many bugs in the process. So skip forward to the late, one of the latest games we put out, uh, Awakening, I think this was four. Yeah, 
anyway, one of our awakening series, one of our most recent of the awakening series. And in this, we, we changed our thinking a little bit. Um, and, the, and the big thing that we changed, I, I, I want to I stop for a second and say one of the, you know, why do we care about all this? Uh, meet Elena. She's one of my favorite people. And she's one of our coders. And people always ask, how many people, how many coders did you have on Awakening? That's a great game. The answer, one half of Elena. We actually had her working on another complete Hopa at the same time she was working on this title. And so think of the cost savings, right? I mean, that, that's a very efficient way to produce games. All of our, pro, our, of, our, of our projects at that time actually only had one half a coder on them because the coder's job was largely to provide tools to a large code base that the designers are using. And as we went from game to game to game, their job was to say when a designer hit a wall that they could not make what they needed to make with the tools that they have right now, then the programmer would break down and say, okay, I will make you that thing that you need. And for us, that was always almost a point of failure. You know, we're never proud of that. We're like, okay, we didn't think of this thing that the designers might need. Let's give it to them and we'll make it and we'll make it hard to break. And once we give it to them, all right, use it. And if you ask for anything else, you're going to have to, you know, show me why it can't be done with the things I made you here. In, in that world, it becomes very efficient. So what we did in the, in the latest version of this is we created um, op codes. So basic, very simple Lua script calls where we say, here's this big, huge piece of Lua script. The designer will never see, never touch, never break. And here's the variables that will exist in it. Um, and so all the designer gets to do is say, I want to do this thing that you told me I could do. And the variables that that contains are this and this and this. Go. And everything else is handled in code and the monkeys can't touch it. And so the monkeys can't break it. And the result was very robust code that came out very quickly and didn't break very often. Um, we did this with a number of other tools. I could go into details, but I don't have a lot of time. Uh, we did Photoshop scripts for exporting things from Photoshop so that they worked for us and layered things properly and named things properly. We did uh, a keyframe editor for our video and animation. Again, it removed a lot of monkey, monkey touching steps. A UI editor that, again, ref refused to allow people to name things improperly or do things improperly or uh, layer things improperly. And this was hard. We spent a lot of time on these tools. But the result was an almost transformative effect on the output of the studio because these tools are shared. If we build this tool for one HOPA, we can keep going for all the rest of the HOPAs. Um, we talked about that. Keep it really simple. Um, I'm, not gonna go, I'm just gonna leave that there. Keep it really simple. <laughs> A, an example, when I was talking earlier, uh, they referred to the decision of rewriting Netscape from scratch as the single worst business decision that a company could make. Um, three years between Navigator 4 and 6, they skipped 5, by the time they finally shipped uh, Netscape 6, they'd gone from an 80% market share to a 20% market share and dropping, and Firefox finally got to be the big product that it was at the time. The first release was incredibly buggy, both in terms of features and compatibility. This story is what I was talking about earlier. When you stop and rebuild everything because you think you can build it better, not only are you losing all the time that you're rebuilding, you're losing the institutional memory of all the things that you fixed before, and during that time, your competitors are still building, and you're losing opportunity. And, and so for us, we always kind of keep this in mind in the way that we develop our code. Um, code gets, Alan likes to say, cruffy. Translate that one, cruffy. Um, he made that word up. Uh, it gets old and dusty. And all programmers feel this desire to go in and rewrite it properly. You know, this, this code is all broken and let me fix it. Because coders like to think that way. Resist this thought. Your new code will get just as cruffy as the old code. For the exact same reasons your old code got cruffy. What's more important is to take your code out and exercise it like a, like a little animal, right? You have to constantly be using it in something so that you can find the walls that it's going to hit and fix the things that are up now. Windows 8 comes out soon. I don't know how many more APIs are going to come out. We've got uh, new network, our new uh, notebooks, not notebooks, what do we call these? Tablets coming out. There's a whole world of stuff that we're going to hit. And all of that stuff is going to require little tweaks. And if all of this is, is flowing into a one build structure that has you know, different options like we do, to go and reconfigure all of that for your brand new code 
you're talking about stopping your whole studio for a year. And that's, that's crazy talk. So we don't do that. Instead, we take the code that we've got now and we exercise it constantly to see if it still works in the situation that we have now and we make small corrections to it. So to, to sum up, um, while they may break your build, ignore naming conventions, demand impossible features, and then forget to use them when you're done, they do help us make better games. Us, them being me. I know it's confusing. I'm supposed to be Alan, remember? Um, they do help push for excellence. They do help doing all the boring work of filling all the data out on the structures that you build for them. The designer is your worst enemy, but he's also your best friend because he's the person that makes your code worthwhile. And so that's, that's him being nice to me, but now I'm being nice to me because I'm him. I know it's very confusing. I'd like to end this with a very funny picture of Alan. Um, that's who's supposed to have been here. This was a, a little gift that we gave to him on his birthday, and I'd just like to note, we plucked his eyebrows and made his eyebrows very pretty. So I think he needs to start doing that. And that's all. I, do we have questions? <laughs> Hello. Do, do I need to, are these going to be questions in English or? I, I can hear just fine. Ah. Uh, uh. It's a how deep is a coal question. Um, it depends on the bug. If it's something small and cosmetic, I don't want to go back over our last 12 games and do a recompile of those last 12 games. Because remember, we've been changing the code base since we released those last 12 games. And so if I go do a recompile of one of our earlier games, yeah, sure, I may fix that bug, but who knows what I've introduced into this old game that we've done since then that we have not tested out. And so for small things, we just don't worry about it. And we let our old games have that bug because it apparently wasn't a problem at the time. For things that are, that are larger, yeah, we have to do that. And it means we go through and do a new testing process. It hasn't been as big a problem as you might think. I, it, when you ask the question, you, it, you immediately think like, wow, that must be a big problem. But historically, over seven years, it hasn't been a big issue. There's only been a couple things that we ran into. And it was always the case of some new thing was released that people used. Um, you know, uh, I, I remember there was, I don't remember what it was, but there was a, a problem with a, a sound library that we used when they released the new version of the Mac uh, OS, and suddenly that didn't work, and we had to go fix that. But it's, it's been a rarer situation than you might think. I don't know if that answers your question. Another small question. Sure. Um, I have worked with a lot of um, uh, code that is really crappy. I was uh, working in projects after uh, a lot of developers was working in that. So uh, there was a lot of, uh, of situations, uh, and I see that uh, in Ukraine, at least, uh, in development, software development, uh, there is a lot of situation when um, I was thinking from the beginning of, of your speech that probably you have experience of creating uh, good frameworks because if you uh, keep um, the same code over so many years, that that means that probably you were thinking in 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 right direction uh, from the beginning. But if if you really have um, uh, difficult crappy code, and if you uh, have what what would you advise to people who uh, over the uh, few a lot of years uh, still creating very crappy code? Okay, so how to organize to <laughs> in this? I, case? I see your question. To answer your question simply. It depends on how crappy the code is. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess there's some code out there that is so bad that it, it, it cannot be fixed. But I've very rarely run into that. Most code has some 
value to it. Um, and, and a lot, I mean, most code can be separated between the, the, the core engine code that's doing the core engine things that any game needs to do and the specific game code that's doing the things that this game needs to do, game logic and that sort of thing. In general, if the first part of the equation is really, really crappy, well, yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can build on a framework that's just terrible. But if the, if the second part of the equation is, is really, really crappy, usually there's still good information in there, um, and, and you can probably go in and, and do some, some changes and some fixes to it. But again, all code is crappy after a certain period of time. I mean, I, no, no programmer on earth has ever looked at somebody else's code that was older than six months and said, wow, this is the code I would have written. Like, like that moment has never happened in a programmer's life. And so one thing I would also worry about, and I, I don't know your background, whether you're a coder or not a coder, but a lot of times coders will come to you and it's a, you know, I didn't build this problem and this code is crappy. It's unusable, crappy code. And what they're really saying is, I did not write this code. And I would, I would be cautious of that. Um, I, I find that coders that write completely unusable, completely crappy code are more rare than you might imagine. They tend to not get jobs as coders. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much.